in this room, same time, same location. Um, he'll be talking about all the different places NASA Edge has been and all the different things they've seen. Um, so that should be fun. And then in November, we, Mark Wagner will be talking about rock art in Illinois and all the eclipse and other astronomy related evidence that we see from the indigenous population of this region. So that should be a really amazing talk as well. All right, so I would like to introduce Matt Penn. Matt is kindly joining us from Arizona. He's getting ready for the annular eclipse. So um, we appreciate him taking time out of his super busy schedule to join us. It's kind of a chaotic time at the moment. Um, so Matt has worked at solar observatories for most of his career. He's been at five different solar observatories. Um, he was one of the lead principal investigators on the Citizen Kate research project that was on the 2017 total solar eclipse. And now he's working as an engineer, but he just can't quite give up all the fun of the solar physics and the solar research. So he's part of the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. He's our one of our lead investigators. So he's going to tell us all about it. Great. Thank you. Um... It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to speak with you guys here today, and um, I think we can, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy if people want to interrupt me and ask questions as we go along, or we can save the questions to the end. Uh, either way is fine with me. So I'd like to speak about uh, the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative, and yeah, I might be the lead, but I'm only a small part of this. Here's just a small list of the people that are involved um, in, in this project as well. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing some people from this list, so I apologize if you don't see yourself uh, uh, referenced here. Um, but as in 2017, we've developed a project where we're trying to get the community involved, uh, everybody from professional astronomers through uh, students, uh, amateur astronomers, high school classes, and general public. Um, in a way to study um, the eclipse and, and develop some science, get some scientific results out of it. So um, we did that successfully in 2017 and fingers crossed for the weather in 2024, we'll see how that goes. Um, but that's the goal is to get some scientific, real scientific research done in the true sense of citizen science, where we uh, use citizens to collect the data. They're an integral part of the process. And then we get a scientific result, a publication out of it. So I think your your lecture series is interesting. It's called The Journey to the Eclipse. And so that reminds me of the old days when people used to actually journey to eclipses. Um, and some of these figures, you know, are, are some of my professors from graduate school who, you know, went to eclipses around the planet uh, in, in, in the 70s and in, in the 80s, uh, 50s, and, you know, way back to the 1920s. So um, people used to actually get on a Pan Am plane like this and journey or just get in a sailboat and journey to see an eclipse because they occur everywhere around the world. And uh, Carbondale is very lucky to get two of them in seven year period. But the, the historic uh, context of a journey to eclipse involved traveling usually halfway around the globe and coming back with some data, some pictures that sort of look something like this. Um, you know, black and white, and it's pretty poor quality. This is from 1923, though, so we'll be doing a lot better than this just from the advance of technology. Um, but people were really interested in studying the corona of the sun, something that's really a structure that we don't understand fully yet. Um, it's hotter than the sun, but, you know, if, if you use just logic, as you move further away from the sun, the gas temperature should drop. So the corona um, totally... Uh, flips our idea of physics on its head, it gets hotter than the surface of the sun as you move further away. Uh, what's so good about an eclipse? Well, this kind of really simplistic diagram shows you what's going on. Of course, um, on the left, if you're sitting in a very dusty room, hopefully your, your living room isn't this dusty, but if you use your thumb to block out a light uh, across the room, you'll see light scattering off of dust particles uh, and going being uh, scattered into your line of sight. This is kind of the, uh, the problem that we have from the ground. We can build uh, telescopes called coronagraphs to look at the corona from the ground, but we're limited by scattered light, um, something along the lines of, of dust particles. 
And so because the corona is a million times fainter than the disk of the sun, any amount of scattered light really impinges on our ability to measure the corona and measure the physical properties of it. When an eclipse happens, of course, on, on the right, you can see that the moon is above the atmosphere of the Earth, so it's beyond all of these sources of scattering. And because the moon's shadow is big, it casts a, a big shadow on the atmosphere as well. And so the sky brightness is reduced by a factor of 10,000 over what it is normally during the day. So we can study the faint corona around the moon um, very easily. And this is why people used to journey to eclipses. Um, as far back as even the 1800s, in order to see the corona <clears throat> without the problem of scattered light from the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, today we have some fantastic missions in orbit around the Earth uh, that NASA uh, runs. Here's uh, an instrument called the LASCO coronagraph, and we can make uh, regular observations of the, of the corona every day. Um, there's a quick movie sequence there. Let me back it up and show you, but... Uh, if I can, here we go. We can see outflows and all sorts of, of um, high velocity streams of plasma leaving the sun, traveling through the corona. But if you look carefully, uh, the NASA LASCO <clears throat> missions block out the very center or the very lower parts of the corona. So the center of this image is just a, something called an occulting disk. The sun is the size of the white circle. And so we're missing uh, information about the corona in this gap from the NASA missions in space. And so that's what a, a solar eclipse can be used now for, is to fill in this gap. Um, if you were really good and, and looked at the velocities in that little movie sequence, when we see particles and, and structures moving through the corona out at this distance, they're moving at a constant speed. When we look at the sun, at the disk of the sun, they have zero outward speed. There's no outflow. And so somehow they have to accelerate from zero to something really fast, something like a thousand kilometers per second or so out here. Uh, we don't see that acceleration in the LASCO field of view. And so it has to happen in this little area that's blocked from the NASA fields of view. And so what an eclipse does is it lets us look down here at this lower layer. So this is a, an old image from 2016. Um, when Bob Bear and his team from Carbondale traveled to Indonesia <clears throat> and took an, uh, an image during an eclipse. So NASA's really good at looking at the, the disk of the sun from space and out here in the outer parts of the corona with the LASCO instruments. But an eclipse from the ground, uh, observations from the, from the ground can still fill in this, this gap. And so an eclipse really provides a window into this area of the corona where a lot of interesting physics is going on. Uh, again, to make a simple analogy, um, the part of the corona that, that LASCO views is like looking at the freeway where the traffic is moving at a constant speed of 75 or 85 miles an hour. And what we really want to know, we really want to see these particles accelerate. So we really want to look at the on-ramp, and that's the inner corona. We want to see how the particles go from zero miles an hour up to 75, because we can determine the physics of those, some interesting physics. Uh, if you're in a, in a Tesla, right, you're going to be able to accelerate in, I don't know, three seconds from zero to 85. But if you're driving a, a diesel tractor trailer, it's going to take you, you know, 30 seconds to make that acceleration. So if you're looking at the on-ramp of a freeway, you can understand some of the physics of the cars by measuring their acceleration. And that's what we hope to do with the particles in the solar corona is understand some of the physics going on based on how they accelerate into the, the freeway of the, of the solar wind. So our journey uh, you know, to eclipses is a little bit different this time. Um, we don't really travel around the globe to take snapshots like we used to. We really want to capture a time sequence and understand the motions of these particles now. Uh, and that's difficult. During an eclipse, you might get two or four minutes of totality when you can see the corona. And measuring uh, speeds of particles during that small amount of time is difficult. What you really want to do is have like an hour or two hours of time to measure structures as they accelerate through your field of view across your camera. So what we did in 2017 is we set up <clears throat> a network of, of telescopes, 70 of them, across the continent from Oregon to South Carolina. 
And by combining the data from these telescopes, we're able to measure uh, or able to make a movie sequence that's about an hour and a half long. And so for 2024, we're hoping to do the same thing, but of course it'll go from Mexico up through Canada, and, uh, south to north uh, in a different pattern. Um, so, so that's kind of the goal and um, the modern equivalent of a journey. We have to somehow uh, prepare all of these sites instead of just one site around the globe, prepare a bunch of sites in the path of totality uh, to, to collect the data that we're interested in now. So 2017 was, was a success. Um, here's a sample image that we collected from one of our 70 sites. Um, there is a lot of information about our experiment on this SIU page, including a movie of, of the sequence that we produced. What we saw is a variety of different things around the, the sun in the inner corona. Um, we also saw some background stars uh, moving uh, uh, as the sun moved across the background stars. We saw that. But the main thing that we focused on in 2017 was an outflow that we saw <clears throat> here on the uh, lower left-hand side of the solar image, the eastern limb of the sun. Uh, when we made a time sequence, a movie of this, we can see um, gas leaving the sun. It turns out that uh, about 30 minutes before the, the totality of the eclipse happened, there was an eruption, and Lasko saw this object, this plasma from this eruption, moving at a constant speed of 250 kilometers per second. Um, but even though we missed the, the front edge of this, we we're able to see trailing particles accelerating off of the surface of the sun. And those are represented in this graph. So this is a plot of the height above the disk of the sun and the radial outflow speed in kilometers per second. So again, Lasko saw a constant velocity and the dots here represent our measurements from um, our 70 citizen Kate sites. What we'd really like to see <clears throat> is something pretty simple that, that would be physically explained uh, easily. And, and that would be the dotted line. So if these particles had an extra acceleration of 15 meters per second squared, then they would follow the dotted line that you see on the, on the graph. But the stars and the error bars that are associated with our measurements uh, don't do that. It's much more complicated, uh, but at least this is the first cut. I think this is only the second paper to measure something like this. And um, you know, the answer it turns out is that it's complicated. Uh, which happens a lot in science, but uh, you know we're able to constrain the acceleration to something around 15 meters per second squared. It's certainly not one or two, and it's certainly not 150. Um, so we're we're making you know cutting edge science measurements with the data from our uh, experiments. So if we look at sort of the the journey through time that we made to to get to this spot, I mean it's not every day that you set up. 70 telescopes across the country and have them all work at the same time, right? So we had several years to prepare for the 2017 eclipse and started out about uh, almost two years ahead in, in 2015 uh, and then had an Indonesian practice run again in about a year and a half in front of 2017 eclipse. And so uh, Fred Ispiner from Carbondale was our first guinea pig. <clears throat> Um, again, no one had done this before, so um, Fred was very brave when he agreed to receive our equipment on his vacation in the Faroe Islands and try to use our software to capture images of the eclipse. And not only that, but the weather in the North Atlantic was not very um, conducive <laughs> to collecting data. Uh, it rained that morning and there are clouds, as you can see, uh, Fred was decked out in his parka. But he did successfully come back with some images. Um, so in the upper left, you can see a composite of about 10 images that he took between clouds of the solar corona. So this is a proof of concept. We could use um, sort of standard off-the-shelf equipment and train uh, a volunteer to actually take data. And it was a much harder task because Fred had to travel around the globe to do it. So um, this gave us some confidence that the idea wasn't that crazy that in 2017, we would be able to train a bunch of volunteers using off-the-shelf equipment and collect images of the corona. <clears throat> so um, 
got some funding and we were able to send uh, four sets of students to Indonesia in 2016. And on the right-hand side, you can see the uh, Carbondale, uh, Wyoming, Western Kentucky, and South Carolina State were the uh, universities that were involved. Um, and again, we used off-the-shelf um, equipment. Uh, this time they traveled around to the Southern Pacific and uh, one of our sites collected some good data. Um, the site from Carbondale Bob and Sarah Kovac collected the image that you see in the background there. So unfortunately we didn't have good weather and we couldn't uh, sort of prove the network idea of stringing images together in 2016. But again, it was a harder task. People had to travel all the way around the world and operate in Indonesia. So we, uh, um, you know, didn't let these students have a free lunch. We said that um, as part of going to Indonesia, when you come back, we're going to ask you to train our volunteers for 2017. And so Sarah and uh, Honor and our other students came back and they were state coordinators. So in 2017, the eclipse ran from Oregon to South Carolina. And so we divided up our volunteer groups by state and had uh, local workshops where they got together to use the equipment. And they were led by a student teamed up with a, a member from the community. Um, so this worked really well. We had several practice sessions. Our list of volunteers was enormous. Um, we had 27 universities and 22 high schools, as well as some museums and national labs uh, participating as well. And then on the day of the event, um, as you can imagine, the the scenery was dramatically different across the country. In, in the Pacific, there are some mountaintop uh, observation sites with volunteers in, in Oregon in particular. And then of course, through the plains in, uh, in Nebraska, things are uh, not as much uh, geography there. And then not only was the geography very different from site to site, but we also had <clears throat> different uh, sort of environments. So the team at uh, Carbondale was uh, in the middle of the stadium, which I imagine was very loud. Uh, and then people, you know, in, in suburban South Carolina were again, at a sort of an isolated site where they can focus without too much distraction. Um, so again, um, it, I'm just a tiny part of this. Uh, we really, uh, this project would not work without the volunteers who, who go off to these sites and uh, run the ex equipment and collect the data. Um, afterwards, we had several different types of follow-up science projects. Um, <clears throat> some of our uh, uh, university students looked at the, the ellipticity or the coronal flattening in our data and compared it with other eclipses, historical eclipses, to see how that fit into the solar cycle, the 11-year solar cycle. Um, one of our volunteers, Zach Stockbridge, organized a group to measure the transit of Mercury, which occurred a couple of years after the 17 eclipse. And he was able to repeat a historic measurement of the uh, size of the solar system. The astronomical unit can be measured by looking at how Mercury appears on the sun from two different sites. Uh, here in, in Tucson, I worked with some high school students and they, uh, they collected some some nice awards in the Arizona State Science Fair. But I think one of the, the most exciting parts of our follow-up uh, work was that some of our teams actually looked at exoplanets. The telescope for the sun was, was pretty small. We're only using about a three inch telescope, but it turns out that with uh, careful work and a good camera, you can actually see an exoplanet transiting another star by looking for the dip in the light from that star. And so uh, Bob Bear and Mike Connolly uh, took a, a fantastic set of data you can see in the lower right that shows um, this transit uh, around the star. Um, you know, of course, you all know that star is HD 189733b. Um, but uh, this really proves the, uh, the, the fact that uh, people even using small telescopes can make important scientific contributions by monitoring exoplanets at night. So after 2017, you know, we didn't want to rest on our laurels. Um, we wanted to figure out what could we do better next time? Um, what would we like to improve? And one of the main things is that I remember in 2017 thinking that uh, 
you know, the night of the eclipse, we could come out with a movie and show everybody, you know, on the evening news that night, what the Corona looked like. Um, so that was a little bit naive because, you know, no one had collected this data before I, I knew that, but the corollary to that is that nobody had analyzed data like this before. And it turns out it took a little bit more than two hours to actually analyze the data. So this time around, we're sort of um, building it in from the start. We'd like to have a dynamic broadcast to show people how the corona evolves through the eclipse. And so um, we'll have a real-time broadcast or a very near real-time. And we've named the project the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. It's right there in the title. Um, this time around, you know, we had some good sponsorship last time. Um, I was in the field as a professional, so we were able to, to develop some, some good funding. But this time we wanted to have cheaper equipment. So if say a, a small high school like uh, Cienega High School here in Tucson, if they wanted to, they could purchase their own equipment. And and that's what they've done. We've cut the, the cost of the equipment package in half, but also we've allowed us, uh, that's allowed us to look at a bigger part of the Corona as well to have more overlap. Um, we want people to participate outside of the path of totality. The totality path is actually really narrow. It's a small swath across the country. And as you know, because you're in Carbondale, everybody from hundreds of miles away comes into that small uh, path. But if we could have people participate from their backyard outside of the path, um, we'd love to have them join. And so we're encouraging that now. And we have several participants across the country. Actually, we have a team in Puerto Rico now um, who's going to participate in, and take scientific data with the idea that when we're looking at the disk of the sun at, at that site in Puerto Rico, at the same time that we're seeing the corona in Carbondale, we can correlate things that happen on the disk of the sun with what happens in the corona. And then finally, we'd like um, things to be easier for follow-up science. I mean, the follow-up uh, projects that we did took a little bit of work and they were mostly run by sort of advanced uh, amateur astronomers. Um, you know, again, like in 2017, people are keeping their equipment after the eclipse and we want them to be able to use it for nighttime work more easily. And so this time we have a go-to mount, which will allow people to just type in coordinates on the laptop that controls uh, the system. <clears throat> and it'll point to a different star cluster or to an exoplanet or to, to other objects in the nighttime sky. So this is the path that we set ourselves on. And um, this is sort of the timeline that we've been using. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have the the total solar eclipses to practice at that we had leading up to 2017. If we look at the solar solar eclipses, the, the events uh, on the top here, um, there's an Antarctic eclipse that uh, we'll talk about that occurred in 2021. There was a total eclipse last April, or I'm sorry, this April, um, 2023. And then, of course, this next weekend, we have an annular eclipse, which is slightly different, but allows us to practice the time critical parts of our experiment. Uh, and then leading up to the 2024 uh, April eclipse. But so this time we also looked at the moon and, you know, the moon is roughly the same size target, which is good. Um, so we looked at some lunar eclipses uh, that are listed on the bottom of this of this timeline. Our first lunar eclipse back in May of 2021, we were able to get simultaneous images from Texas and California. And so I uh, should have warned people to bring your 3D glasses, but if you have 3D glasses, you'll be able to see that the moon is standing out in front of the background stars. And a subsequent eclipse in, uh, in November of 2022, we were able to make um, much more detailed images of the the moon plus the background stars. And that's one of the problems that we have during a total eclipse is that the corona around the sun, very close to the sun, is very bright. And it drops off by a factor of about 3,000 in brightness across our field of view. So a total lunar eclipse allows us to measure, um, to see if we can measure that intensity difference. Can we capture the disk of the moon and then also the faint background stars? And we were able to do that with HDR imaging in. November of 2022. Um, finally, as far as that Antarctic eclipse goes, um, again, Fred Isbener was uh, was gracious enough to to uh, take some equipment along on his on his trip to see this eclipse. You can tell that we've uh, reduced the size. It's this type of package was 
much smaller than the big luggage cases that we had to send to him in 2016. Uh, but unfortunately, the weather was very strange and the, the cruise ship had to reverse course at the last minute to, to keep up with, with a gap in the clouds. So on the image on the left, you can see that Fred was able to capture um, the partial phase of the eclipse. But even though he saw totality um, and, and everyone on his boat was able to see it with their eyes, he was not able to image it, unfortunately. But we did learn some things about the software and the hardware in way back in 2021 due to the work that Fred was able to do for us. And then we employed those and developed a new set of hardware, new sets of software, and uh, different, uh, different procedures for the eclipse in, in 2023. And uh, the team from Carbondale did a fantastic job. I'm not sure exactly how many people you took to Australia, but it was quite a bit. Here's some, in the background is some uh, outreach that was done. So for the uh, residents of Exmouth in uh, Western Australia, uh, Carbondale had a bunch of telescopes for people to look at the uh, partial phases. And you can see that there are some images that were also taken. There's a full frame image of the partial eclipse taken with our uh, DEB equipment. And then some nighttime shots that uh, I think Chris Mandrell was able to take as well. During totality, uh, you know, things happen. And unfortunately, there are some um, software issues and um, some mechanical issues as well. So we were not able to take an image of the corona with our dev equipment in Australia. Instead, uh, the team used some backup telescopes that they had running. I think they had four telescopes running on the corona at that time. And so in the lower right, we see an image taken with one of the backup telescopes, which is still a very spectacular image, um, a smaller field of view than we're aiming to get with the dev equipment. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we're, we're hoping to create a movie sequence of in 2024. Um, I won't go through the equipment too much, but we're using you know, some off the shelf stuff. You can buy a lot of these things from Amazon yourself. Um, and the hope is that uh, that will inspire a bunch of people to get involved in in either amateur astronomy or or nighttime astronomy or solar astronomy um, by using some readily available equipment in, in the right way. <clears throat> and again, here's the system. It's it's kind of a modest uh, setup, um, but uh, again, we're able to see the um, the corona out to an extended area and have good overlap with the NASA missions. The uh, telescope will track, and that's one of our, our main goals um, next weekend, is that the uh, partial phases of the eclipse will last three hours. And so we want to get our teams um, set up so that they can track uh, the sun and the solar disk during the whole three-hour period. Even though totality only lasts four minutes in 2024, um, having that uh, polar alignment uh, set up very well will improve our data during the four minute uh, totality period if we if we have practiced tracking for three hours. So where are we at these days? Um, you know things are things are getting to be crunch time now. We're a week out from the uh, from the annular eclipse. We're getting some some really decent images and and the um, the system that we're using is is not uh, not very customized software. Most of it is is readily available software. Um, Chris Mandrell in, in Carbondale has done a great job uh, with some custom customization of it. But we're hoping to get people to use a, an image capture routine that's readily available called SharpGap, along with a, an image processing package called Planetary System Stacker. And even with a tiny, um, you know, it's not even a two inch telescope this time around, we're able to observe sunspots um, in, in detail large and small sunspots. And then at the limb of the sun, you can see bright areas. These are magnetically active areas called faculae or active network. So the images that we're able to get, you know, here we are seven years later with a smaller telescope are looking even better than what we were able to get in 2017. We have a network of people now. Um, we have something like about 40 uh, groups that have equipment uh, today. And about half of those uh, groups uh, are taking images. This is, oh gosh, um, 
maybe a month old by now where we just had five teams practicing on one weekend. We were able to get images of the sun, you know, from Kentucky through the, the California sites um, during our practice run. And the uh, UPS person I'm sure in Carbondale is really familiar with the physics department uh, because they've delivered a lot of boxes. And then after they've been modified, uh, they've been shipped out again across the country. So um, there's been a lot of work uh, just logistically getting equipment to our volunteers, again, from sites from, um, you know, Oregon to Puerto Rico and everything in between. And then we've been running, um, like I said, uh, this practice session was about a month ago. We've been running practice sessions pretty much every weekend now. And uh, this weekend, tomorrow, will be our last session before the annular eclipse. So here we have uh, an online, either a Zoom meeting or a Discord uh, online meeting, and uh, try to step people through any problems that they're having, but also try to evaluate the types of imaging that they're doing, if their exposure is too high or if if their filter uh, parameters are, are not quite right, or if their tracking is off, which way they can adjust their mount. So instead of being in person, like we were in 2017, we've gone to a remote sort of training paradigm and it has challenges, but also advantages. Um, so uh, there's there are good and bad things about, about going this direction. So fingers crossed, um, I think tomorrow we'll, we'll, we'll know exactly how many teams will be able to upload images for the annular eclipse and uh, how that will look uh, on our web page or uh, broadcast through the NASA uh, TV system. We'll do some practicing with that. And then we'll have six months to take what we learn uh, next week and, and polish it up and refine it so that in April we're uh, functioning, we're hitting all cylinders and doing a good job. But then after April, like I said, we're hoping for some follow-up science from our citizen volunteers. Um, we can do some, you know, decent nighttime astrophotography with, with this small telescope and, and the camera and mount system. In, in the upper left here is a uh, galaxy M101 that had a supernova. You can see the, the bright star in the galaxy at about four o'clock position is, is the supernova. So you can actually make extra galactic observations that uh, that are useful with our with our system. There's some sort of artistic representations of of nebula. And in terms of you know using off the shelf components, we can then easily upgrade the system, or people can upgrade their systems as they want. So um, we can get better solar filters. In the upper left is a particular wavelength of light uh, emitted by calcium atoms. And that shows the sunspots in more contrast and the, the bright magnetic areas in much more detail. And then in the background is, uh, is using a color camera with our telescope, um, looking at the uh, uh, Rho Ophiuchi uh, nebula, dark nebula in the Milky Way. And that's you know just from my backyard. So uh, people who have an interest in astrophotography can upgrade their cameras and, and uh, take some relatively decent uh, images with the system. But then in terms of science, you know, astrophotography is, is nice, but uh, scientific publications are, are the best. We're again, hoping to do some exoplanet observations like we did in 2017 with, with our follow-up work. Um, when we look at the solar images, um, I think uh, maybe some of you know that the sun is covered with, um, it's like a pot of boiling water. It's covered with a, a network of convective cells called granulation. Um, those are actually a little bit too small for us to see with uh, this two inch telescope. <clears throat> but instead what we see are the uh, oscillation waves that the convective energy produces on the sun. And so the image on the uh, lower left is a little bit complicated. What we have here is kind of a spectrum in um, wavelength and also in frequency of these five minute solar P modes. They're called P modes because they're uh, restored with pressure, they're pressure waves. Uh, and it's sort of like seismic activity on the earth. They're sort of like sun quakes that happen on the surface of the sun. But uh, our telescopes um, allow us to measure P modes very accurately. And uh, this is something that's brand new. They were discovered in the sixties but now you can do it from your backyard. You can make these measurements uh, from your backyard using the, the DEB instrument. 
And then finally, of course, we have a lot of variable stars in the sky, but also asteroids um, in our solar system often have um, variable light uh, output. They reflect <clears throat> different amounts of light as time goes on. And so we can look at the light curves, how the light reflected off an asteroid changes. And this tells us something about the geometry of the asteroid itself. So here's some sample data for the asteroid called Cleopatra. Um, and it has, it's very oblong asteroid. So when we're looking at the narrow end of the asteroid, it appears to be faint. And then when it rotates on its own axis to show us the, the broad end, then we can see uh, much more light reflected from the asteroid. So our current status, um, this is kind of, uh, kind of needs to be updated, but again, we have about 40 sites uh, with equipment right now. In November, we're going to add 20 more uh, with a gra grant from the National Science Foundation. And then we have a group of about 10 core team members uh, that have purchased their own equipment and are taking data uh, as part of our network as well. Um, we do have a lot of uh, volunteers. And so, yeah, this this current volunteer status is is not correct. We have 40 teams with, with equipment. So we've made a lot of progress in the past month since I updated this slide. I apologize. Um, and then we also have some uh, sites in Mexico and Canada, and we've developed some private funding for those sites. So um, we do have, um, I think, five sites in Mexico from the coast of Guadalajara up through uh, the center part of Mexico, and some Canadian sites as well from uh, north of uh, New York, near the Ontario area, out to uh, Newfoundland on the coast of Canada. Okay, so next weekend, this is the path of the annular eclipse. And you can see that um, it passes over San Antonio and Albuquerque. Um, but then a lot of the sites along the path are kind of remote. <clears throat> If you're in this path, uh, shown by the two red lines, then the moon will move uh, right through the center of the sun, and you'll see an annulus, a ring of light, uh, at the peak of the eclipse. Um, the rest of the country will see a partial eclipse. So in Carbondale, I think it'll be about a 50% coverage. Um, in Tucson, is something more like 80% coverage. The closer you are to this central line, the more coverage you'll get during the partial phases. But we'll have about um, 20, I think about 20 groups along the path of annularity, and then several sites outside of the path, again, from Oregon, actually in Vancouver, we have a site through to uh, uh, Puerto Rico, up to Newfoundland and down to uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. So quite a large baseline of, of coverage. And then the main event, of course, is in April of 2024. Um, so far, uh, the weather forecast, uh, the average uh, forecast shows that the further south and west you go, the more chance of clear skies you get. So Mexico through Texas and even up to Carbondale is looking good in terms of weather forecast, uh, or I'm sorry, climate. And then, of course, Canada and the uh, northeast part of the continent has more chance of getting cloudy. Um, but, you know, people say that, uh, I forget exactly what the saying is, climate is what you predict and weather is what you get. So um, if we looked at what happened last year, or I'm sorry, this year on April 8th, uh, Texas and Mexico were completely clouded and the rest of the path was clear. So we'll see what happens. Um, it'll be much dicier weather than we had in, in August of 2017, I'm sure. Um, but again, we've got sites, uh, we'll have about 40 uh, maybe even 60 sites along the path of, of the eclipse itself. And then again, sites outside of the path, collecting data uh, on the disk of the sun. So finally, I wanted to end with uh, how you can get involved. Um, we are still looking for volunteers, especially if you're interested in um, developing some sort of curriculum. If you're a teacher and uh, you want to have your students look at this data or get involved with taking data. Um, there are lots of ways that you can incorporate things about eclipses into uh, learning modules. And um, and we're sort of lacking on that. We're sort of scrambling to get hardware sent out. 
But uh, in the bigger picture, we'd love to have people uh, use our data afterwards for educational as well as for research um, purposes. So we have um, pretty much all of our regional coordinators and most of our site observers figured out at this point. But if you're interested, um, please contact us and we'd be uh, happy to talk about uh, how to get you involved. Here's my email directly, or we have a group email as well, uh, devinitiative at gmail.com. And then our website is devinitiative.org. And uh, on the day of the eclipse, uh, not next weekend, but in April, uh, we hope to show you how the uh, corona is evolving and changing with time uh, as the eclipse evolves across the country. Okay, that's that's what I had. I'd be happy to take questions and and uh, answer any any questions that you guys might have. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. It's Mike, so he should be able to hear you. So Matt, let us know if you can't hear. Hi, I was just a um, great great presentation, but um, I was just curious, why is the Lasco disc so big? If it, if you want to see that inner part. Yeah, it's, um, well, LASCO was sent up in the early 2000s and it has to do with spacecraft jitter. So as you're pointing at the sun, um, there are a lot of different thermal and other problems that cause spacecraft jitter. Um, and so you wanna make sure that the very sensitive instrument that you're using to image the corona does not see the disk of the sun. Otherwise you would lose probably lose the whole detector uh, if, if that happened. And so they've compensated uh, maybe a little conservatively by making that occulting disk very, very large. Um, today, I, I think we could probably do a better job from space, but there just hasn't been funding to do that. So um, we'll see. There may be a day where the inner corona can be observed regularly uh, from space, but we're not there yet. Other questions? Matt, I've got one for you. What was the most surprising thing that you didn't expect out of the 2017 work? Well, um, the fact that we were able to see this material on the trailing side of this eruption. I mean, normally, um, actually, every study before our 2017 study just measured the front edge of those eruptions coming off of the sun and used that velocity. Um, but there's a lot of material after that eruption that also is ejected into space. And we were actually able to see that. Um, so we made the first measurements of that trailing uh, material, um, which, which is surprising. I mean, if you look at the Lasco images from space, you, you, can, you can see that material that trails the leading edge but people from the ground weren't able to see that before. So um, it was a great surprise because you really can't count on an eruption happening during the eclipse because they happen infrequently, maybe once a day uh, at best case. But because the material that's trailing that leading edge also is, is being accelerated, um, really improves the likelihood that we'll be able to measure that acceleration. So that was a very pleasant surprise. How well will those be visible during the annular since we're not blocking the whole sun? Will you be able to see any of them? Yeah, no. An annular eclipse is a completely different uh, a different event. Um, I mean, it's it's beautiful and, and uh, seeing a, a ring of light, a ring of sunlight is, is really a unique thing. Um, but yeah, the sky is still very bright because you can still see the disk of the sun and um, you know, at, when you're at a total eclipse, you, you get that impression, right? Because the sky is still very bright and you really can't see the corona until the very last drops are blocked out. So when you have an entire ring of sunlight, yeah, the corona is, is just not visible at all. So what we're hoping to do is, again, to use it as a, as a time critical practice for everybody because, you know, you have to be ready when the eclipse starts. You can't stop the moon. It's going to, the eclipse is going to happen whether you're ready or not. And that's that's a really hard thing to get used to when you're setting up an experiment. But also, we're hoping to look at uh, the limb of the moon. So uh, there are mountains and valleys on the limb of the moon. And as the moon uh, moves across the disk of the sun during the annular phase, 
um, those will be uh, visible. And if you're looking at the, the moon from Oregon and comparing it with what you see in Texas, it'll be very different, like I showed you with the 3D image. So we're hoping to see different parts of the lunar limb when we make these diagrams of the valleys and mountains uh, in Oregon with, with the data from Oregon and compare it with the data from Texas. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Matt. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Are you ready for next Saturday? <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Me too. Okay. I want to thank everybody for 